This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. This week is the 40th anniversary of the Able Archer NATO exercise, where it's reckoned that the Soviet Union and NATO almost went to war with nuclear weapons. The following is an audio version of the talk I delivered to the Manchester Military History Society in the UK in October of 2023. I'm delighted to welcome Ian Sanders to our Cold War conversation. In October 2022, President Joe Biden told the Democratic Party faithful at a fundraiser, we have not faced the prospect of nuclear Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. What Biden or his speechmaker were forgetting, amongst many others, was that the world teetered on the brink of nuclear war far more recently than 1962. Unlike the 1962 event, when President John F. Kennedy's televised speeches received blanket coverage and alarmed the world, the 1983 crisis, which was at least as dangerous as the Cuban Missile Face-Off in October 62, was played largely out of public view. Classification kept most of the 1983 events in the shadows. However, when government papers were finally declassified, it was apparent that more than one incident in 1983 almost set us on the path to war. So let's give some context to the run-up to 1983. Détente is a diplomacy term originating from around 1912 when France and Germany tried unsuccessfully to reduce tensions. And now it's most often used to refer to a period of general easing of geopolitical tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War. Following the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, both the US and the Soviet Union agreed to install a direct hotline between Washington and Moscow, And despite the movie depictions, it's not actually a telephone. It was a teleprinter that was intended to enable leaders of both countries to communicate rapidly in the event of another potentially catastrophic confrontation. Détente began in 1969 as a core element of the foreign policy of the United States under President Richard Nixon. In the Soviet Union, the leader was Leonid Brezhnev, and Brezhnev and Nixon got on really well. There's some lovely photos of them sitting on benches and chatting away as though they're um, best buddies. But the reason for Dayton was to try and avoid an escalation of conflict with the Eastern Bloc, and the Nixon administration promoted greater dialogue with the Soviet government in order to facilitate negotiations over arms control and other bilateral agreements. Détente saw the ratification of major disarmament treaties such as the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty and the creation of more symbolic pacts such as the Helsinki Accords. An ongoing debate amongst historians exists as to how successful the Détente period was in achieving peace. However, one of the high points of Détente was the handshake that took place in space. In July 1975, the first Soviet-American joint space flight was conducted, the Apollo-Soyuz test project. Its primary goal was the creation of an international docking system, which would allow two different spacecraft to join in orbit, and this would allow both crews to collaborate on space exploration and potentially help in rescues in the event of an accident in space. The project marked the end of the space race, which had started in 1957 with the launch of Sputnik 1 and allowed tensions between the Americans and the Soviets to decrease significantly. I have an episode on the Apollo-Soyuz mission, so uh, do check out the link in the episode notes for that one. Now, détente was considered to have ended after the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan in 1979, which led to the United States boycott of the 1980 Moscow Olympics. President Jimmy Carter was in power at the time of the uh, Soviet intervention, and he was ousted in 1980 with the election of Ronald Reagan, whose campaign was based largely on being against detente, inducing a period of rising tension. 
In his first press conference, Reagan claimed that the US's pursuit of detente had been used by the Soviet Union to further its interest. Now that brings us back to 1983 and Time magazine's Men of the Year. So there's two men depicted on the cover. One of them is Ronald Reagan, the 40th president of the United States from 1981 to 1989. And the other is Yuri Andropov, the sixth leader of the Soviet Union and the fourth general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So let's have a look at Reagan first. Uh, as I said before, Reagan had rejected detente and he ordered a massive defence build up. He revived the B-1 Lancer bomber program that had been rejected by the Carter administration and deployed the MX missile. Now, in the meantime, the Soviets had deployed a mobile nuclear missile system called the SS-20 in Eastern Europe. And Reagan oversaw in response NATO's deployment of the Pershing and cruise missile mobile systems in Western Europe. Reagan also gave covert aid to Afghan Mujahideen forces through Pakistan against the Soviets. And in 1982, he tried to cut off the Soviet Union's access to hard currency by impeding its proposed gas pipeline to Western Europe. Incredible how uh, history uh, repeats itself. So uh, the blocking of this gas pipeline did hurt the Soviet economy and it also caused much ill will amongst American allies in Europe who counted on that revenue. And uh, Reagan later retreated on the issue. Now, one of the initiatives that Reagan's probably most known for is the Star Wars program, the Strategic Defense Initiative. Now, this was a system to protect the United States from intercontinental ballistic missiles. Reagan believed that this shield could protect the country from nuclear destruction in the event of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. However, the scientific community was sceptical about its feasibility and Yuri Andropov said it would lead to an extremely dangerous path. In March 1983, Ronald Reagan also gave a speech to the National Association of Evangelicals where he described the Soviet Union as an evil empire. So let's have a look at Yuri Andropov. So after Leonid Brezhnev's 18-year rule, Andropov served in the post from 1982 until his death in 1984. Indeed, he was a sick man in 1983, confined to a hospital in, in Moscow with a liver complaint. Uh, Andropov was Soviet ambassador to Hungary from 1954 to 1957, during which time he was involved in the suppression of the 1956 Hungarian uprising. He was named chairman of the KGB on the 10th of May 1967. And during the Prague Spring in 1968, Andropov was the main advocate of taking extreme measures against Czechoslovakia. After Brezhnev suffered from a stroke in 1975 that impaired his ability to govern, Andropov increasingly dictated Soviet policymaking as part of a brains trust comprising of Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko, Defence Minister Andrei Grechko and Grechko's successor, Marshal Dmitry Ustinov, throughout the rest of Brezhnev's rule. In 1981, whilst Brezhnev was still alive, Yuri Andropov initiated Operation Ryan. Now, Operation Ryan was the Soviet Union's biggest peacetime intelligence operation. Project Ryan, it's an acronym for uh, the Russian for nuclear missile attack. I'm not going to attempt to uh, pronounce the, the Russian. Um, so it was aimed to anticipate a surprise nuclear strike by using computer technology alongside human intelligence to monitor indicators from NATO and the United States. And I'll come on to those indicators later. The operation's first two years were largely uneventful as the Soviets maintained an outward calm despite the newly elected Reagan's escalatory policies. Then in 1983, the United States moved to place Pershing and cruise missiles in West Germany. Now, the Pershing particularly would be able to reach Soviet soil in less than 10 minutes. 
giving the Soviets little or no warning in the event of a strike. So just looking at it from a Soviet point of view, it looked like the US was seeking a strategic advantage. So you've got the Star Wars program, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which is intended to shoot down attacking nuclear missiles. And you've got the US deploying a missile system that can strike the Soviet Union with little or, or no notice and decapitate the uh, the country. So Andropov responds by alerting the KGB residenturas worldwide that Project Rian had acquired a special degree of urgency. Meanwhile, in the public sphere, he's denouncing the Reagan administration for disrupting the fragile nuclear balance between the two superpowers. Now, United States intelligence had anticipated that the strategic defense initiative Star Wars would elicit a negative reaction from the Soviet Union. And in a now declassified CIA report on this, it predicted that the Soviet Union would respond to SDI through political and diplomatic channels, but failing that would consider taking limited military measures like conducting sabotage against key US facilities. So the, the US knew that the Soviets would be rattled by, by this stuff. Meanwhile, increased collaboration between the KGB and other Warsaw Pact intelligence agencies demonstrated Project Rian's growing gravity. So there's a 1983 note on a meeting between the Stasi leadership in East Germany and the KGB, which describes the US actions as signs that aggressive imperialist circles were increasing their preparations for war. Now, I mentioned the indicators or the indicator catalogue for Operation Rian, and there's some obvious ones in there, such as activation of US and NATO command centres, urgent communications amongst NATO allies, and increased combat readiness of NATO forces. However, there's some more subtle indicators mentioned in there, such as the parking of large numbers of vehicles used by official people in the parking lot of the White House. And in the UK, the KGB were keeping an eye on the Ministry of Defence offices, believing that lights being on late at night indicated increased activity. I'm not sure what time of the day Soviet cleaners clean their offices, but they'd obviously not anticipated that in the UK it's generally at night that offices are cleaned. Uh, the KGB were also checking if hospitals were stockpiling blood plasma. But in addition to the rhetoric of um, the US during this period, there are other events that occur that appear to confirm Soviet suspicions that the US is planning an attack. Fleet X-83 was a naval exercise that took place between March and April of 1983 in the northern Pacific near the Aleutian Islands. There were three carrier groups participating, including Enterprise, Midway and Coral Sea and their respective escort ships. According to Admiral Robert Long, Commander-in-Chief of the US Forces in the Pacific, Fleet X-83 comprised the largest fleet exercise conducted by the Pacific Fleet since World War II. 40 ships, 23,000 crew members and 300 aircraft. The exercise lasted approximately two weeks and was conducted in the northern Pacific in the Sea of Ohotsk, within flight range of the Soviet Union. Now, the purpose of this exercise was to intentionally provoke the Soviet Union into responding so that US forces could study their response, tactics and capabilities, as well as demonstrate the effective operation of a three carrier battle force. Now, the Sea of Ohotsk was important to the Soviet Union then, and it's still important to uh, Russia now. They, they view it as an inland sea. Surrounded by Siberia, the Kamchatka Peninsula, Sakhalin Island and the Kural Island chain. And it's used as what's known as a bastion area. So as a, a location to hide Soviet nuclear ballistic missile submarines. So the Soviets don't take too well to people putting carrier battle groups into their inland sea. It's their lake. It's their home ground. <laughs> 
But on the 4th of April 1983, at the conclusion of this large naval exercise, two US carrier battle groups are transiting south through the Kurile Island chain. And F-14s and F-4 fighter aircraft from those carriers overfly Soviet territory. And more insulting to the Soviets, the F-4s unbelievably practiced mock bomb runs on Soviet military facilities in the Kurile Islands chain. So let, let's just look at that again. So the US were actually flying over Soviet territory and conducting mock bombing runs on Soviet military bases. To make matters worse for the Soviets, they had a MiG-23 base on the Kurile Islands and not a single MiG-23 got off the ground during these incursions. So not only did the US Navy conduct these mock bomb runs, but they got away with it without being intercepted by any Soviet aircraft. In retaliation, the Soviets ordered an overflight of America's Aleutian Islands and complained to the UN over America's airspace violations. Soviet air defence officers in the Far East were fired for failing to respond to the overflights, and across the Far East, Soviet air defence units maintained a maximum hair-trigger alert through the summer months of 1983. No Soviet colonel wanted to be the one who failed to respond should another violation of Soviet airspace occur. So now we get to early September 1983. And Korean Airlines Flight 007 has just taken off from Anchorage in Alaska. It's on its way to Seoul in South Korea. However, owing to a navigational error made by the crew, the airliner drifts off its original planned route and flies on into Soviet prohibited airspace. The Soviets launch fighters from Kamchatka, but they just don't catch up with it. So the flight carries on and flies over Petropavlovsk. Now that's a very important naval base for the Soviets. It's where the Pacific Fleet is based and it's the home of their ballistic missile submarines. The flight continues over the Sea of Ohotsk, the same body of water where Fleet X-83 had been poking the bear earlier in the year. The aircraft was not reacquired by Soviet radar until it approached Sakhalin Island all the way to the other side of the Sea of Ohotsk. The Soviet air forces treated the unidentified aircraft as an intruding US spy plane, despite identifying it as a Boeing 747 rather than a Boeing 707 like most of the US spy planes. Um, however, the pilot who shot the aircraft down did not report it as a Boeing 747 until he landed. So the Soviet fighter planes who catch up with the Korean airliner do fire warning shots uh, across the nose of the aircraft, but the crew don't respond. So they then shoot down the Korean airliner using air-to-air -air missiles. It eventually crashes into the sea near Monoron Island west of Sakhalin in the Sea of Japan, and all 269 passengers and crew aboard are killed, including Larry MacDonald, a US senator. On September the 5th, 1983, President Reagan condemns the shooting down of the aircraft as the Korean Airline Massacre, a crime against humanity that must never be forgotten and an act of barbarism and inhuman brutality. The following day, the US ambassador to the United Nations, Jean Kirkpatrick, delivered an audiovisual presentation in the UN Security Council. Using audio tapes of the Soviet pilots' radio conversations and a map of Flight 007's path in depicting its shooting down. Following this presentation, TASS, the Soviet press agency, acknowledged for the first time that the aircraft had indeed been shot down after warnings were ignored. The Soviets challenged many of the facts presented by the US and revealed the previously unknown presence of a US Air Force RC-135 surveillance aircraft in the area. When US Air Force intelligence had a look at 
exactly what had happened using the intelligence that they gleaned from from radio and other sources. They concluded that the Soviets had got confused about the mystery aircraft's identity. Inadvertently, the Korean airliner had flown through the orbital path of a U.S. Air Force RC-135 Cobra Ball mission. So this was a surveillance mission that was monitoring a predicted Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile test launch. When the launch didn't occur, the RC-135 returned to base, whilst the Korean 747 flew on towards the Kamchatka Peninsula and Soviet airspace well to the north of its planned route. It would not have been unusual for Soviet radar operators to confuse the two. Soviet long-range surveillance radars were not particularly accurate at this time. As a result of the incident, the United States altered tracking procedures for aircraft departing from Alaska and President Ronald Reagan issued a directive making American satellite-based radio navigation global positioning system freely available for civilian use once it was sufficiently developed. But that wasn't all that happened during that period. On September the 3rd, the crash site of KAL-007 was the scene of another incident. So the crash site was a small body of water close to Soviet territorial waters. It became extremely crowded, with Soviet Navy ships, US Navy ships and Japanese ships in close proximity. And in the airspace over and above the crash site, it became very, very crowded with Soviet intelligence collectors, search and rescue planes from both the Soviet Union and the United States and fighter planes. And as a result, an incident occurred on the afternoon of the 3rd of September. The Soviets believed that a US Air Force plane had violated their territory and the Soviets gave two MiG-23s target destruct orders on that aircraft. The aircraft was a US Navy EP-3, an intelligence collection aircraft that had a crew of about 12. Now, I interviewed Brian Mora, who was a US intelligence officer, actually in the command center in Japan at the time that this incident happened. So he had a ringside view of exactly what happened that day. And uh, we have an episode with uh, Brian Mora, in our catalogue. I'll add that to the episode notes as well. And Brian has also written an excellent fictional account of the incidents in 1983 entitled The Able Archers, which I will also be including in the episode information. So Brian told me that the US knew that the MiG-23s had target destruct orders. So from the command center at Yokota Air Base in Japan, we alerted the EP-3 to take evasive action. Now, those planes fly at 25,000 feet. So the only evasive action they could take was to dive right the way down to the wave tops and try and pull the aircraft up out of the dive before they crashed into the sea. And that's what they did. The MiG-23s followed the EP-3 down, but lost them probably because Soviet radars didn't really have what would be what we'd call a look down shoot down capability at that time. So they lost the EP3 probably in the wave clutter which is when you get down close to the ocean there's a lot of clutter for the radar to deal with coming off the waves. In the meantime because these MiG-23s had target destruct orders just like the Su-15s had two nights earlier with KAL-007 the U.S. commanding general, Charles L. Donnelly Jr., ordered a flight of four F-15s to go and intercept the MiG-23s, which they did. They intercepted them successfully and were in a position to shoot them down when Donnelly calls them back. But the F-15s had firing solutions for the MiG-23s and the crews are saying, we can get them. We can get these MiG-23s now. The flight lead was not happy and he did repeat the instruction to be recalled back just to make sure that he was clear. He was an Air Force major. I mean, their their blood was up. An unarmed civilian airliner had been shot down a few days earlier with 269 dead. A defenceless US reconnaissance aircraft was now being targeted. So you can imagine them being angry. 
at being recalled. And when another general officer on the scene pointedly questioned Donnelly's decision not to engage the MiGs, Donnelly responded with, I don't think I'll start World War Three this afternoon. Now, if that wasn't enough for the 3rd of September, there was another incident involving a Japanese television aircraft who was trying to take pictures of the crash site. The Soviet air defence system identified this Japanese aircraft as a border violator, which is why they were going to try and shoot down the EP-3. And they sent two different MiG-23s up to shoot down the Japanese plane. Now, that situation was diffused by a young Russian pilot who is anonymous to history. He was the flight lead of those two MiG-23s. He identified the aircraft correctly as a civilian television plane. And he basically said to his commander, are you sure you want me to shoot this down? The commander answers, yes, we're sure. It's a border violator. You have your order. Shoot it down. And this young pilot responded with, oh, we're low on fuel. We're returning to base. Three weeks after the Korean airliner incident, on the 26th of September 1983, Stanislav Petrov, a lieutenant colonel in the Soviet Air Defence Forces, was the officer on duty at Serpukov 15 bunker near Moscow, which housed the command centre of the Soviet early warning satellites, codenamed OCO. Now, Petrov was a signal processing engineer. He wasn't normally on watch like this, but he was substituting for a fellow officer who was off sick. But Petrov possessed a unique knowledge of the strengths and, most importantly, the flaws of the Soviet's new satellite warning system. His responsibilities that night included observing the satellite early warning network and notifying his superiors of any impending nuclear missile attack against the Soviet Union. If notification was received from the early warning systems that inbound missiles had been detected, the Soviet Union strategy was an immediate compulsory nuclear counterattack against the United States. And shortly after midnight, The unthinkable happened. The computers reported one intercontinental ballistic missile heading towards the Soviet Union from the United States. Petrov considered the detection looked like a computer error, since a first strike from the United States would likely involve hundreds of missile launches, not just one. Furthermore, the satellite system's reliability had been questioned in the past. So Petrov dismissed the warning as a false alarm, although accounts of the event differ as to whether he notified his superiors or not after he concluded that the computer detections were false and that no missile had been launched. Petrov's suspicion that the warning system was malfunctioning was confirmed when no missile in fact arrived. He began to relax again. But then the computers identified another four additional missiles in the air all directed towards the Soviet Union. Petrov again believed that the computer system was malfunctioning, despite having no direct means to confirm this. The Soviet Union's land radar was incapable of detecting missiles beyond the horizon. He was correct. He's also known as the man who saved the world, and it was subsequently determined that the false alarms were caused by a rare alignment of sunlight on high-altitude clouds. In explaining his decision, he cited his belief and training that any US first strike would be massive, so five missiles seemed an illogical start. In addition, the launch detection system was new, and in his view, not yet wholly trustworthy, whilst ground radar had failed to pick up evidence even after several minutes of the false alarm. He was the right man in the right place that night. What you've got to remember here is there's this steady drumbeat of raising of tension with the US. You've got Fleet X-83 where they're poking the bear in their own backyard. You've got the fact that the Soviet defences are on this, like, trigger alert, which results in the shooting down of KAL. 
007, and you've got this malfunctioning missile alert. If Petrov had called Moscow and reported what he was seeing, there is a possibility that the Soviets would have launched an all-out nuclear attack on the United States. It's incredible. It's incredible. As we move into October, there's another event that the Soviets will look at with suspicion. Grenada had gained independence from the UK in 1974. However, the communist new dual movement had seized power in a coup in 1979 under Morris Bishop. They suspended the constitution and detained several political prisoners. In September 1983, an internal power struggle began over Bishop's leadership performance within the People's Revolutionary Government, which resulted in his house arrest and execution and the establishment of a revolutionary military council. The Reagan administration mounted a US military intervention following receipt of a formal appeal for help from the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, which in turn had received a covert appeal for assistance from the Governor General of Grenada. President Reagan stated that he was compelled to act due to concerns over 600 US medical students on the island and fears of a repeat of the Iran hostage crisis, which ended less than three years earlier. According to future United States Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger, who was serving as Reagan's Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs at the time of the invasion, the prime motivation for the US intervention was to get rid of the coup leader and the students were the pretext. Nearly 8,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen and marines participated in Operation Urgent Fury, along with 353 Caribbean allies from the Caribbean Peace Forces. The Americans sustained 19 killed and 116 wounded. There were Cuban military forces on the island. 25 of those were killed, 59 wounded and 638 captured. Grenadian forces suffered 45 killed and 358 wounded. And at least 24 civilians were also killed, 18 of whom died in an accidental US bombing of a Grenadian mental hospital. The invasion was criticised by many countries. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher privately disproved of the mission, in part because she was not consulted in advance and was given very short notice of the military operation, but she supported it in the press. She gave Ronald Reagan a real ear bashing over the phone. Um, I'm not sure there's a recording of it, but there's certainly a script of it available online. But So I'll make sure that I put that in the uh, episode notes as well. So we now move into November and Abel Archer. Uh, some of you will be familiar with Abel Archer from the TV series Deutschland 83, where it's the uh, military exercise that forms a major theme of that series. Abel Archer was a large scale nuclear war drill designed to test NATO's command and control structure. It did include unusual elements such as the loading of nuclear warheads, reports of nuclear strikes, strict communication security and a countdown to general alert. Now, all of these supported the Soviets Operation Rian indicators about a potential NATO first strike. And considering the extreme tension pervading US and Soviet relations in the autumn of 1983, the timing of Abel Archer was awful, to put it mildly. However, to its, the exercise planners and participants, the drill was robust but routine. And what you've got to remember here is Abel Archer did occur every year. It wasn't just occurring in 1983, but with the tension and the potential for misunderstanding, this was not a good time to be pretending to load uh, nuclear weapons. Brigadier General Leonard H. Perutz was a 50-year-old senior intelligence officer for the U.S. Air Forces in Europe. He was based at Ramstein Air Force Base. He's credited with helping to avert a nuclear war with the Soviet Union during Abel Archer 83. Brian Morrow, who I mentioned earlier, who was at Yokota Air Base in Japan when uh, the Korean airliner was shot down, did work closely with Perutz after Abel Archer and did get to know him well. And we talk about his relationship with him in the uh, episode that I did with Brian. 
on his retirement from the Air Force, Perutz wrote a report about Abel Archer that was finally declassified by the State Department in February 2021. But then the CIA sued to have it reclassified and a federal judge ruled on October the 4th, 2022, that it should indeed be reclassified. Um, thankfully, there are versions still available online and I will uh, link to those in the episode notes as well. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of the aspects of Perut's report to uh, take you through what happened. So it states that the annual NATO command and control exercise Able Archer was scheduled to begin during the first week of November. The context of this nuclear command and control exercise was relatively benign. The scenario had purposely been chosen to be non-controversial and the exercise itself was a routine annual event. Perut says there was no particular feeling of tension in the European theatre. Beyond that, which is normal, apart from the fact that the Soviet intelligence collection assets, primarily low level signals intercept units, had failed to return to garrison after their normal coverage of NATO's Autumn Forge exercise series. So the Soviets have left units in the field specifically to listen in on what NATO is up to. Perutz continues, as the kickoff date of Abel Archer neared, it was clear that there was a great deal of Soviet interest. Again, this seemed nothing out of the ordinary. We knew that there was a history of intense Soviet collection against practice emergency action messages related to nuclear release. He says that Abel Archer started in the morning of the 3rd of November and progressed immediately in a scenario to NATO State Orange, a chemical weapons attack. So they role play that. And so the conflict escalates from a conventional land based war to an attack using biological and chemical weapons. Now, on the 4th of November, the NSA issued a report. So this is one day after Abel Archer has started. But the report relates to changes in Soviet readiness on the 2nd of November, the day before Abel Archer started. So it's from the NSA and uh, it states that as of seven o'clock on the 2nd of November, the five bomber divisions of the Air Force of Group Soviet Forces Germany had been placed on a status of heightened alert. The report says that all divisional and regimental command posts and supporting command and control were to be manned round the clock in addition to this, these reports stated that these aircraft were to be armed and placed on a 30-minute alert ready to destroy first-line enemy targets. So this report is indicating that the Soviets are potentially getting ready to carry out a preemptive strike on NATO. Now, Perutz didn't have access to a lot of information that could definitively tell him what was going on. He, In his position, he would just get fragmentary information and it wouldn't necessarily be in real time, a bit like this report. You know, this was a, a day or so later up after it had happened. But what he does say is he discussed this report with his air analysts and they took it to mean that these aircraft in East Germany were actually loading and possibly preparing for a preemptive strike. So naturally, he goes to his commander and he says to his commander that we've had some unusual activity in East Germany. It's probably a reaction to the ongoing Abel Archer exercise. His commander asked him what he thought they should do. Should they increase the real force generation, i.e. should they increase the readiness of NATO forces in response. Perut says that they should continue to carefully watch the situation. They should not change their readiness status. And he says that there was insufficient evidence to justify increasing our real alert posture. Now, What's significant in Perut's report 
is that he goes on to say that if I had known then what I later found out, I am uncertain what advice I would have given to my commander. So what he's basically saying there or implying there that maybe he would have raised the alert level if he had seen other indicators around Soviet readiness. Now, that decision could have been disastrous. And just to highlight why, in his report, he goes on to mention another NSA message, which was received in December, so months after Abel Archer had finished. And that message was entitled Soviet Air Army at Heightened Readiness in Reaction to Abel Archer. And it read, Signals Intelligence showed that Soviet 4th Air Army alert included preparations for the immediate use of nuclear weapons. So the Soviet 4th Air Army was getting ready to launch nuclear weapons. So this is activity that was going on in East Germany at the time of Abel Archer, but Perutz didn't have sight of it. So let's just analyse that a little bit further. It's not just that the Soviets thought the US was preparing to strike them. It appears as though the Soviets were actively moving towards mounting a preemptive nuclear strike on NATO. Now, there's other people who potentially helped save a catastrophe around Abel Archer. And I'm going to talk about a couple of them. One of them is Rainer Rupp. Now, he grew up in West Germany with strong leftist political leanings. In 1968, he was recruited to spy for the Stasi. He continued his studies in Brussels, trained as a spy in East Berlin and was hired by NATO in 1977. Codenamed Topaz, he rose quickly in the ranks, provided photos of some 10,000 pages to his controllers. He included the precise location plans for Cruise and Pershing nuclear missiles in Western Europe, as well as the central MC-161 document, which summarised NATO's strategy as well as NATO's analysis of the Warsaw Pact and its intentions. All of these documents were promptly transferred to the KGB. Rupp claims that his activities may have averted a nuclear war in the autumn of 1983, a claim that's not entirely unfounded, according to American experts. In an interview for the Channel 4 programme 1983, The Brink of Apocalypse, which is available on YouTube, and I'll add another link to uh, that in the episode notes. So he says that he transmitted a message back to his Stasi handlers that NATO was not preparing to launch a surprise nuclear attack against the Soviet Union. He viewed this as being vital in preventing a Soviet preemptive strike against NATO forces. And in the same program, Rupp said that he was proud of the damage he did to NATO over the years in his intelligence activities. The other person I wanted to mention was Oleg Gordievsky. He joined the KGB in 1963, was posted to the Soviet embassy in Copenhagen in 1966, and he became outraged by the Soviet crushing of the Prague Spring reform movement in Czechoslovakia in August 68. This is the same event that Andropov advocated extreme measures against the Czechs in 1968. So as a result of that, he began sending covert signals to Danish and British intelligence agencies, telling them that he might be willing to cooperate with them. And in 1974, he agreed to pass secrets to the MI6, the British Intelligence Services, a step he viewed as nothing less than undermining the Soviet system. MI6 gave him the codename Sunbeam. 
The KGB posted Gordievsky to London in June 1982. He steadily advanced in rank there and with the help of secret aid and manipulation by MI6, which handed him abundant non-damaging information and contacts, but also steadily banished his direct superiors back to Moscow on trumped-up charges so that Gordievsky took their place. So basically MI6 were trying to badmouth Gordievsky's bosses um, so that Gordievsky could then get to the top of the tree in the uh, embassy in London. He continued to provide secret information to the uh, to MI6 while in London, and uh, his code name was then changed to Nocton. Now, the CIA knew that the British had a source, a high-level source. They didn't know who it was, but they had received some of the uh, information, and they were desperate to try and find out um, who he was. Um, so they, they gave him the code name of Tickle. And in late April 1985, he was promoted to KGB station chief or resident, which basically meant he was in charge of KGB activities in the UK. But he was suddenly summoned back to Moscow in May. And what he didn't know is that he'd been betrayed. So what had happened is the CIA had eventually worked out Gordievsky's identity. However, within the CIA, there was a Soviet agent called Aldrich Ames, and he betrayed Gordievsky to Moscow. So once he once Gordievsky returned to Moscow, he was drugged and interrogated, but not charged. He was under a lot of surveillance, managed to signal to MI6 that he needed to be uh, extricated and uh, managed to escape back to the UK. I mean, it's Gordievsky's story is an incredible story, and I recommend uh, there's a book by Ben McIntyre called The Spy and the Traitor. Um, and again, I'll put a link to uh, that in the episode notes, but it describes the story. I, there, there should be a movie made of it. I'm sure somebody has got the, uh, the rights to that somewhere. Um, but once he's uh, got back to the UK, what, the UK and the US can do is actually act on Gordievsky's intelligence because that won't put him in any danger. Now, two of Gordievsky's most important contributions were highlighting how the Soviets had misinterpreted Abel Archer 83 as a potential first strike um, and also identifying Mikhail Gorbachev as the Soviet heir apparent long before he came to uh, prominence. And indeed, the information passed by Gordievsky became the first proof in the West of how worried the Soviet leadership had become about the possibility of a NATO first strike. And the, these insights had a profound effect on Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in rethinking how they approached the Soviet Union, and which in turn helped them really manage the, the end of the Cold War. I mean, you know, both of those leaders almost have an, an epiphany at that moment. Now, at the time, the full extent of Soviet preparations for nuclear war had not been understood by the Americans, as, as we outlined. And it, it took months to assemble the intelligence and create a complete assessment. And even then, there were disagreements within the intelligence community as to how close we'd come to a nuclear war. But the CIA director at the time, Casey, became convinced that they'd nearly stumbled into a nuclear war. He briefed Ronald Reagan and the National Security Council principals. And the president noted in his diary in June 1984 how shocked he was to learn the Soviets believed the West was planning to launch a nuclear first strike. And it highlighted that this complete lack of communication between Moscow and Washington just provided fertile ground for catastrophic miscalculation. Remarkably, the, the Soviet people had been given some clue. Uh, Soviet Politburo member Grigory Romanov had given a national address in November 1983 where he describes the geopolitical situation in dire terms. Soviet citizens were ordered to participate in civil defence exercises, including evacuations to nuclear fallout shelters in Moscow and other major cities. 
Factories, offices and schools conducted civil defence drills and the Soviet general staff cancelled the annual autumn deployment of Soviet army troops to help with agricultural harvests, keeping those forces in garrison instead. Now, that's quite an, an important change. I mean, the Soviet army was an integral part of the agricultural economy of the Soviet Union and having them not assist with the harvests would have had a significant impact there so that's not something to be um, underestimated soviet nuclear forces remained on varying degrees of alert through the early months of 1984 andropov died in february 84 uh, replaced by konstantin chernenko who i think lasted about 18 months and then uh, gorbachev came in operation rian was wound down later in 1984 um, Perutz was promoted to a major general and became a senior intelligence officer on the air staff and later on became director of the Defence Intelligence Agency in 1985. And the uh, 1989 report from the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board praised Perutz's actions. Stanislav Petrov was investigated by Soviet authorities after the... Uh, false alarm incident and it was determined that he'd insufficiently documented his actions during the crisis um he explained it that because uh, i had a phone in one hand and an intercom in the other i didn't have a third hand so petrov received a reprimand and in 1984 he left the military and got a job at research institute um he died in 2017 from pneumonia age 77 now there is still controversy about how close we came to nuclear war, particularly around Abel Archer. And in May 84, a US intelligence report on the implications of recent Soviet military political activities described the war scare as a propaganda concoction aimed at discrediting US policies and mobilizing peace pressure amongst various audiences abroad through nuclear alarmism. But contrarily, the President's Advisory Board report of 1990 states that during the early 1980s, the Soviets perceived that the chances of the US launching a first strike, perhaps under cover of a routine training exercise, were growing and that the US intelligence community had underestimated the Soviet Union's fears. In the scholarly world, different opinions abound, as you would expect. Some maintain that the Abel Archer incident was a nuclear near miss and comparable to the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Others argue that such an interpretation overestimates the significance of Project Rian and the extent of the Soviet government's reaction to Abel Archer. In my view, Abel Archer was one of many incidents in 1983 that could have triggered huge unintended consequences. And pending further declassification of related Soviet documents, which doesn't appear to be going to be happening anytime soon, uh, the nature of the Soviet preparations and uh, reactions are, are likely to remain open to interpretation. Now, what I would like to do is to thank Brian Mora for his um, assistance in producing this talk and uh, recommend his book, The Able Archers. And I'd also like to thank Francesca Akhtar, who is at uh, UCL in London. Uh, she's a US intelligence and Cold War expert, and she's been delving into the archives and uh, has done two episodes with me on this subject. One is episode 19, and the other is episode 2. Six nine. So do check those out and also do check out Brian's episode, episode 229, where we talk in more detail about him being in the Yokota Command Center when the Korean airliners shot down. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping 
the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.